This is the new Cord Mojo 2. There's been lots of information flying around the internet about this one, and I've been slightly disappointed to see some people claim that Cord Gear is just overpriced, over-engineered stuff that's not really worth the money, and particularly that all they're doing is applying DSP to make the sound come out a certain way. Now often I open a review with something like that as an actual question to answer, but in this case I think it's just not even a valid question. There's lots of information, there's lots of data around about why Cord do what they do, and so in this review my focus is going to be more on discussing why none of that is the case, why the Mojo 2 is an incredible piece of engineering, but of course there is one question which is whether or not it equates to a better listening experience. The Mojo 2 is due for release soon, I don't have an exact date at this time, but I do believe it's now available for pre-order at the time of this review, and the actual release in terms of the products being available to grab and to play with yourself, that's coming soon as well I believe. Now I specifically raised the availability status because I'm also not 100% clear on the pricing, but as far as I can tell, the Mojo 2 will retail for around about $700. US Now that might sound like a lot of money, and indeed it is a fair amount of money, but if the claims from Robots and Cord Electronics are true, then what you're getting for your $700 US is an incredibly accomplished DAC, a DAC that actually can be on the level of full-size desktop DACs at a similar price, or maybe even higher potentially, we'll test that soon, but one that is also completely portable and something that can take that same level of sound quality with you on the road using a transport like your smartphone, a cord poly should you have one, this will be fully compatible with the poly, or of course you could use a cheap basic digital audio player with some kind of digital output. Before we start talking about the upgraded details, features, etc. of the Mojo 2 and then of course the sound quality, I wanted to start off first and foremost by explaining for anyone not familiar with this device, I wanted to tell you what it actually is. So the Mojo 2 is a fully featured DAC and headphone amp in this tiny little package here. It has high sample rate capabilities, so it will play everything from your MP3s all the way through all sorts of FLAC and other PCM files up to DSD. In other words, any commonly available format, this is going to handle it just fine. In terms of power output in the amplification stage, the Mojo 2 will deliver 90 milliwatts to a 300 ohm load, and it will deliver 600 milliwatts to a 30 ohm load. Now that may not sound like big numbers, everything's in the milliwatts there, but to put that into context for you, if you take headphones that are moderately difficult to drive, like say the Hi-Fi-Man Sundara and the Hi-Fi-Man Aria Stealth Magnet version, both of those only need 40 milliwatts to reach 110 decibels. So this has about 600 milliwatts available at the same impedance level as those headphones operate. So we've got a need for 40 milliwatts, but this is delivering 600. At the higher end of the impedance range, if you were to take something like a 250 ohm Biodynamic DT880, that's going to require only about 20 to 25 milliwatts for the same levels of power, and this is delivering 90 milliwatts. So as you can see, it's got plenty of power for normal headphones. Yes, it is going to run out of puff for something like an Abyss 1266 or a Hi-Fi and Susfara or a headphone potentially, as in an HEDD headphone. So some of those really difficult to drive headphones, this might not cut it for, but for everything else, it's absolutely fine. On top of that, it's got an incredible volume control, which means that you've also got no problems at all driving your IEMs, no matter how sensitive they are. So it's a fully featured and very versatile DAC and headphone amp. 
one final thing to point out, and we will circle back to this later, is you can also take a line out from the headphone sockets and drive it into an external amplifier to get the maximum amount of power that you need. So this, as I said before, can be a desktop DAC, it can be an all-in-one desktop device, or it can be a portable DAC and headphone amp, similar to a dongle, but obviously bigger than that. So very, very versatile, and at around $700, US it does a huge amount for the money, the question, of course, is going to come back to whether it's doing it as well as you would want for that sort of money, but we will get there soon. Before we get to that, though, I just want to talk a little bit about what I said at the beginning, where some people will say that this is over-engineered or at least over-marketed jargon-based value that's not substantiated in performance and design. And I want to share with you a story of something that happened to me recently. For ages in our kitchen, we've had a couple of cheap non-stick frying pans. They work really well, nothing sticks to them, they cook the food. Because I'm into cooking and food, I've started to look at improving the kitchen utensils that I use, and one of those things, of course, is the fry pans that I use. And so I went out and I spent nearly 200 Australian dollars on a cast iron fry pan. Now immediately, you could look at the two fry pans that I was comparing, a cheap $15, $20 nonstick pan from a local supermarket compared to nearly $200 on this cast iron pan. And you might look at the two of them and say, but the nonstick pan has more technology. It's got Teflon and other sorts of coatings built in to prevent food sticking. Whereas the cast iron is just cast iron. And so therefore you could say that all of the marketing and the conversation around why cast iron might be better, you could say it's all hype. But the reality is that everything my wife and I have cooked in that pan has come out better cooked and more enjoyable than anything we've done in the nonstick pan, except for pancakes admittedly, but that's a different story. But my point here is, and I hope you're still with me here, my point here is that on paper, on the surface, if you don't necessarily understand what's going on, the cast iron fry pan looks like a total ripoff. It looks like a whole lot of marketing designed to sell something that's actually inferior. But when you get it and you play with it and you experience it for yourself, you suddenly realize why a quality, well-made cast iron pan is so much better than that Teflon coated cheap pan. Now I'm not here to review pans, it's not an area specialty, but my point is, I think a lot of people underestimate what goes into a product like the Mojo 2, and indeed lots of different products. The same could be said of Shit's multi-bit products, because they're a bit different, and they're not necessarily understood, and that leads people to say it's all just marketing jargon. So what I'm trying to say, and hopefully what I'm getting across here, is that there is more going on here than marketing jargon. And just because we don't necessarily understand all of what's going on, it doesn't make it not impactful and significant to the listening experience. And therefore my aim now is to share with you in very everyday simple terms exactly what's going on and why I think it makes a big difference. But there is one final point I want to cover off before we get into that detail. And that is that I am a fan of cord products, but I am not a fanboy of cord. I want to make that really, really clear. There are things I don't like about how they design their products. There are things that I criticize about their products. I'm also always on the lookout for a product that does it better than cord. So you're going to hear me talk in this review about some things I don't like about the Mojo too. You're also going to hear me share the things I do like. And that's my aim is to be balanced and fair with this. But I do want to make it clear, I think Robot's approach to audio is a very, very good one. It makes sense from a scientific point of view, and in my experience, it makes sense from a subjective listening point of view. And with all that said, let's jump into the details. So in moving from the Mojo to the Mojo 2, Cord had a few challenges. One of them was obviously to make a product that was better, and the other one was to make a product that was still going to work for users that had bought the poly streaming device. Now the poly streaming device which I own and I sort of love, the poly streaming device provides excellent quality streaming audio, but it comes at the cost of a really crappy interface. But the key point is anyone like me that has the poly has invested a significant amount of money and probably a fair bit of time getting used to it and its quirks, and they're absolutely going to want to use it with the Mojo 2. And so that was part of Cord's challenge when they came up with the Mojo 2 design, was they had to keep some things intact. So specifically the things they needed to keep intact was the general form factor, and in addition to the form factor, they had to keep the pair of micro USB sockets that connect to the Cord Poly. Having said that, they also wanted to upgrade connectivity, and that's why they've squeezed in a USB-C socket. And so just to give you a really quick tour of the actual device itself, on this panel here, we've got a coax input socket, that's for a 3.5mm coax cable. You've then also got a pair of micro USB sockets, which are exactly the same as the Mojo, and as I said, they're there for the poly connection. And what they allow you to do is 
you can charge with one of them and you can feed a USB signal with the other if you're not using the poly. Below that, as I already mentioned, we've got USB-C and that's entirely for a USB connection to a source device such as a phone, a portable music player or a PC or Mac. The final thing on this panel is an optical input for Toslink. So you've got all the major inputs covered on this panel and on the other end, a very simple output panel with two 3.5mm headphone sockets. The final thing I want to mention about the design is that where there used to be three large round buttons on the Mojo, there are now four smaller round buttons on the Mojo 2, which is both good and bad in my opinion. I understand why they've done it. To fit in a fourth button, they had to make them smaller. And the fourth button is a very valuable button because it's a menu button. And that allows the Mojo 2 to give you lots of extra control that the original Mojo didn't. If you look at some of the subtle things that have also been done to the casing, there are little tiny touches that at first you may not notice. For instance, the cutout on this side is now shallower I'm guessing to allow more space for other components. One of the feet on the bottom, the rubber feet, has been removed and instead the USB-C socket has been rubberized to act as the fourth foot. It also feels to me like the casing is maybe a slightly different thickness of aluminium or maybe a different grade of aluminium. I think the casing itself is probably a little bit lighter because the battery inside is bigger and there's potentially more circuitry as well. I haven't popped them open to have a look. The key point being, Cord have gone to a lot of trouble to manufacture a product that on the surface looks almost identical, but brings a lot more functionality internally. I've already alluded to the battery. There's 9% more battery capacity in here, and that leads to slightly better battery life when you're on the go, but it's also been paired up to a much more intelligent charging system, which is going to mean that the battery itself lasts longer in terms of its lifespan. So Cord is saying that you'll get about eight hours use out of a single charge of the Mojo 2 battery. But in addition to that, if you do leave it plugged in as a desktop device, or you've charged it to full and left it plugged in, the device is clever enough to not keep trickling power into the Mojo 2's battery. And that means it's not gonna degrade the battery life in its long-term sense, and therefore give you a device that works well for many years. Rob Watts has also put a lot of attention into the power circuit within the Mojo 2, to ensure that when it's working in desktop mode, it's able to deliver almost as good a sound, if not as good a sound, as it does when it's running in battery mode. Now I haven't tested that in detail, because my theory is, if you're buying one of these for yourself, you've got lots of different choices. You could feed it from an external battery if you feel like that's improving it, or a linear power supply even. Or of course you can just detach the power once it's charged, and then run it in its battery mode for maximum potential sound quality. I haven't delved too deep into that because there's so much other ground to cover. I've already covered off the inclusion of the micro USB socket for source connectivity. It's not for charging, it's only for connectivity. And then most of the other stuff going on all comes down to the chip, the FPGA or the Field Programmable Gate Array chip that is built inside the Mojo 2 itself. Now the original Mojo also used an FPGA, but with some tweaks to the way power is managed within the Mojo 2, Rob Watts has been able to extract even more potential from the FPGA. And what that translates to is that there is now a fully functional EQ built into the Mojo 2. There's also a different output stage where they've removed the coupling capacitor to allow a greater sense of transparency from the device. They've also increased the number of taps used in the processing of the digital signal. So that's now up to 40,000 or nearly 41,000. So there's a modest increase in taps. But if you think about the fact that the average DAC on the market, say a Sabre chip or an AKM chip, most of those are using hundreds, maybe a thousand taps. I don't recall the exact numbers, but the point being that the increase from the Mojo to the Mojo 2, that increase amount is more taps than an average DAC actually uses in total. So it's a really big increase in processing power compared to a traditional DAC, but in percentage from the Mojo to the Mojo 2, it's only a modest increase. Now what those taps are doing, just in case you're not familiar with Cord DACs, is that Rob Watts has designed his own custom filters. I've covered these off in my interview series with Rob Watts, so I recommend you take a look at that if you're interested in knowing more. But what he's basically doing here is he's applying very complex algorithms over and over again. And the theory is that the more times you apply the algorithm, the more accurate the timing of the signal gets. The timing of the signal is crucial in delivering things like spatial information and the timbral or the tonal qualities of the sound. And so the more taps you have, the more accurate you get in terms of the tonality and the spatial qualities of the sound. So that's the focus of increasing the taps from the Mojo to the Mojo 2 is improving those qualities. The final thing that's important to talk about is that they've also put a lot of effort into further reducing any sense of noise floor, and in particular, noise floor modulation. In this case, not decreasing the noise floor modulation, but ensuring that it's stayed 
unmeasurable. So noise floor modulation is a really big deal. It's a thing that gets in the way of, again, our spatial perceptions in the audio. And the idea is that if you've got a noise floor that is actually fluctuating with the signal, our brains have a lot of trouble separating what is signal and what is noise. If the noise is constant, our brains are much better at saying, okay, that's constant noise. There's a fluctuating signal above it. I can tell what is music because it fluctuates compared to the noise, which is static. So the static noise is not such an issue. It's the noise that goes up and down with the music. That's the problem. And that's noise floor modulation. Now, according to Rob Watts, that's where a lot of other products fall short. But it's also something that we don't see published. I'm not set up with any sort of testing rig to prove this or test this. I would love to see some people run some tests of this to prove if it's true or not. For now, I'm going to talk about what I hear. And hopefully that's because of what's been designed in. But I can't say 100% if the claim is true that other DACs don't do so well in that area. So let's now take a deep dive into the actual functionality that's been enabled by some of these improvements. And I'm going to start by talking about the menu button. So the menu button on the Mojo 2 is a brand new thing, as I've already mentioned, and it gives you access to a bunch of new features. It lets you do things like access crossfeed, the EQ, which I'll talk in depth about in a moment. It gives you access to change the brightness levels, which you could also do on the original Mojo. And it also lets you lock the controls. So if you're going to have this sitting in your pocket, or maybe you've got it set up on your desk and you want it to always operate exactly the same way, you can set it and you can lock it. So I really like the fact that there is a menu button and the sort of functionality it provides. Whilst I'm not going to go into depth about the crossfeed function, I do want to say that I absolutely adore Cord's implementation of crossfeed. I'm not particularly a fan of crossfeed in a lot of implementations because I do feel like somehow it degrades the sound. I feel like a sense of clarity and transparency gets lost once crossfeed gets switched on. But that's not the case with Cord. I sometimes use crossfeed on the TT2 and it's the same implementation on the Mojo 2 and it's absolutely brilliant. So if you're a fan of crossfeed, the Mojo 2 could be a really good device for you, assuming it sounds good and we'll get to that shortly. Before we get to that though, I do want to talk about two small problems that I have with the menu button implementation. The first one is, I don't understand why the lock function has been put all the way at the end of the list. If I'm mobile with this and I've got it set and I want to be able to pop it in my pocket and forget about it or in a bag and forget about it, I want to get to that lock function quickly to turn it on and turn it off again. So the fact that I have to scroll through all of the different settings, which means I press for the crossfeed slash brightness setting, and then the EQ setting one, two, three, four, and then the lock. So we're now at six presses. That to me is too many presses to get to a function that I might want more often. I actually would have liked to see the lock as maybe the first or second function before the EQ. Now that's just me and how I see myself using the device. Others might say, no, it's more important to get to the EQ first. That's totally fine. I'm just sharing my experience working with the device and seeing how I thought I might use it. So that one's a fairly minor quibble. I think it could go either way. It's very much preferential. The one that I think is slightly less minimal is the issue that I have with the use of the menu button also as the indicator light. There's a problem here. Let me show you on screen. If I turn on the Mojo, you'll see that there's lights lit up there where you've got the menu, you've got the volume, and currently the power light is off because there's no signal coming through. Let's say I want to access the menu, and maybe I want to access a very specific band of the EQ. If I press the menu button, it changes colors to tell me which setting I'm on. Can you see the problem? When you've got your finger on the menu button, pressing the button, you actually can't see what color it is. I think it would have been really good if the power button showed the indicator light while the menu button was being pressed. Again, it's a relatively minor issue, but I have found it slightly annoying that if I've got it in my hand, I can't see when I press the button which setting I'm on. Now, no doubt as you get used to the commonly used functions here, you'll probably just know that it's four presses to get to the EQ you use all the time. But in the short term, I do think it's a bit of an oversight that the color of the button is obscured by the pressing of the button. I know another issue that people are going to have with this is that the use of colored lights means you have to remember what each color means. So what I found myself doing was more getting to know the order of the menu and less so the color of the menu. So I know that it goes from crossfeed and brightness into the bass, into the second bass, into the treble, into the second treble, and into lock mode. So it's very easy once you get used to the order of the menu and therefore the color is less meaningful and that probably does also somewhat negate my concerns about the colored light being obscured. 
but they're all little things that I think some people are going to have an issue with, others won't care about, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. Where all this leads us to though, is that I've talked a lot about the EQ and you might be busting to know how it all works. Rob Watts and Cord Electronics have been fairly bold in their claims that this is the world's first lossless EQ. And when they say lossless, there is a bit of ambiguity there because the nature of an EQ is instantly changing the original signal. So it's no longer a bit perfect signal because you've altered the original stream just by the process of adding bass, pulling back treble, whatever you might've done. Their point when they say lossless is that the process of doing the EQ is not affecting the signal quality. And that's a big issue in most EQs, probably all EQs according to Chord, it's all EQs. And the biggest issue comes from phase shifts. Rob Watts has explained in quite a lot of detail in a Darko Audio podcast episode, which is excellent. I recommend listening to that if you want to understand it more. But in layman's terms, what he's explained is that most DSPs and other forms of EQ, what they're doing is they're having to adjust very, very small signals. And because they're operating on very small signals and it's having to use mathematical processes to do it, you need an extremely fine detail of processing to ensure that the tiniest signals don't get essentially rounded down to zero. Now that's my layman's summary of what they're saying. There's a lot more to it. And as I said, go and check out the Dark Up Audio podcast if you want to understand it more. But the gist of it is, if you're not working at the extreme levels that Robots has built into the Mojo 2, then what you're actually doing is you're chopping off some of the very, very fine details entirely and you're also shifting the phase depending on the frequency and the level of the signal. And whilst phase shift for an overall signal aren't a huge issue, so in other words, if your entire signal is reversed in phase, it's probably not a big deal. But if you shift part of the signal, let's say you're shifting the peaks of the signal in phase and the lower level signals are not shifted, then your whole audio wave is not going to be quite right and the ear will hear that not as some drastic error, but as harshness and inaccuracy in the subtle timings in the overall sound. And so that's been the emphasis of the design of the Mojo 2 EQ. The intent from Robots and Chord was to make an EQ that is absolutely sonically transparent. And there's been a lot of work that's gone into that, and I can say that the results are pretty astounding. I'm generally not an EQ user for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I have always found them to degrade the sound quality slightly. And on top of that, I actually enjoy just hearing each earphone or headphone for its own characteristics. I'm not a purist in the sense that I think people shouldn't use EQ. If you want to use it and you enjoy it, go for it. But it's not something I've generally used. Having said that, Playing around with the EQ on the Mojo 2 is a whole lot of fun, partly because it's really simple, you don't have to worry about too many variables, and also because you can play to your heart's content and you're not going to mess with the signal quality. But at this point, you might be itching to know what exactly are the EQ settings. And that's a bit interesting and I don't necessarily agree with some of the choices made. The settings themselves all range from plus 9dB to minus 9dB. So regardless of the frequency we're talking about, it's got the same maximum and minimum range, so you can boost it or you can cut it. The first frequency band you have access to is a peak at 20 hertz. So the idea of this is you're only boosting the absolute sub-frequency range. In my experience testing this, it's going to make a minimal impact on a lot of music because not all music goes that low down. Because of the sharpness of the curve, it doesn't bleed too high up into the bass, so this is very much just going to give you the absolute deepest, deepest sub-bass boost, and it's going to be helpful for a headphone or an earphone that rolls off a little bit sooner than you'd like, or if you like a bit of extra substance in the sub-bass from your music. Keep in mind that if you're listening to music like jazz, acoustic, folk, a fair bit of classical music, this 20Hz boost is probably not going to show up too much at all. The next setting though is a 125 hertz shelf and that has much more impact and it's a really good setting in my opinion. This is going to give you a straight lift to everything from 125 hertz down and what it means is you can essentially give a bass boost that's contained in the bass. It doesn't bleed up into the mids, it just brings fullness and richness to all bass coming out of the Mojo 2. It's a setting I can see people getting a lot of use out of, particularly if you've got a slightly lean headphone or earphone, or on the flip side, if you've got a slightly overly bassy headphone or earphone and you just want to tame it a little bit. After the 125Hz shelf, we jump to another shelf which is at 3kHz. So this is going to do the same thing except in the treble frequencies. 
Now it is worth keeping in mind that if you're boosting at 3 kilohertz, you are going to be boosting the range where sibilance happens, and so it can lead to a bit of sibilance in the sound, not because the Mojo 2 is getting harsh, but because you're actually boosting the frequencies where those things lie, and if you've got an earphone or a headphone that's already a little bit hot there, it can get a bit too much. On the flip side though, it does allow you to also cut those frequencies to take a little bit of the spice out of the headphone or earphone, and I'll talk more about that in a listing example shortly. The final option in frequencies is a 20 kilohertz peak. So just like the 20 hertz peak, we can do the same thing at the other end. Now, I think this one is fairly irrelevant. I don't know why Rob Watts chose to put 20 kilohertz in there, and I don't say that to suggest that I know better. I just find it not particularly useful in my listening tests. Keep in mind that as we age, we lose a lot of the sound above 16 kilohertz. And so that 9 dB boost isn't really having much of an impact on the audible range of frequencies. So for me, I would have loved to see that 20 kilohertz peak come down just a little bit, maybe to 18 or even 16 K. But as it is, you can add just a tiny bit of sense of air and that sort of upper openness to the sound by boosting 20k if you want to, it's just not as impactful even at maximum setting as I think it could have been and maybe should have been. Now I imagine you're probably itching for me to get into sound quality and my listening tests and I am going to get there in just a second. The one final final thing I want to point out is another minor gripe with the setup of the Mojo 2's buttons. And that is that when you're running the EQ settings, you're relying on a subtle color scale to work out which setting you're on. The problem I have with that is that if you're running a 44.1 kilohertz signal into the Mojo 2 while you're doing your EQ settings, then the power button is going to be red. It also happens that the very first setting of the EQ is a very, very dim red. And so what will happen is that when you're in EQ mode, if you're listening to music, as I said, at 44.1 and the power light is red to indicate that sample rate, there's going to be a bleed of that red light into the plus button. And so when you're on zero setting, it actually looks like you're in a plus one dB setting in the EQ. And so it took me a few times actually turning that light on and off to work out whether I actually had it set to plus one or whether it was actually at zero. Now, I don't know if there was a way internally that they could have actually shielded the power button from the other buttons from a light point of view. And it's again, not a big deal, but it was slightly annoying that I had to keep checking if I'd left it on plus one or if I'd come back to zero. So it's not like it's a massive issue, but it was just a minor thing. And as I said before, I don't want to pretend that everything about the Mojo 2 is perfect. And so I did want to share with you any of those little gripes and tiny annoyances that I found along the way, or big ones for that matter. I did want to share them with you so you know everything you're getting into if you're pre-ordering one of these. And with all that said, let's get to the most important thing, which is how this device sounds. Rather than do any sort of isolation listening and describing the Mojo 2 sitting on its own, I've done two comparisons that I hope you'll find really interesting. The first and most obvious one was to compare it with the original Mojo. I imagine there's going to be a lot of people trying to decide if they should upgrade from the Mojo to the Mojo 2. And so there's two things I'm trying to do here. First and foremost is to give you an overall sense of the qualities of the Mojo 2 on its own, but also to give you a sense if I think it's a worthy upgrade from the Mojo. For this testing, I wanted to keep everything as level as I could. And so I ran both devices from the same USB cable out of my computer, obviously meaning I had to switch in between. And from the Mojo and the Mojo 2, I then used my hi fi and Aria Stealth Magnet version as my headphone of choice. I listened to a bunch of tracks, but the one that I found really revealing and really helpful for my listening notes was Washing Day by Amber Rubarth. This is a binaural recording, so if you're listening on headphones, you get that incredible sense of space and three-dimensionality that you can only get with headphones from a binaural recording. Starting off with the original Mojo, the sound is fantastic. There's a great sense of space, there's a good sense of natural tonality across the board, everything was really great. Changing over to the Mojo 2 though, everything got significantly better. The sense of space opened up more, the focus of the image and the instruments was stronger, although there's really only the two instruments in this, if I remember rightly, but both of those became beautifully focused. And in addition to that, the transparency of the Mojo 2 did become evident. There was a greater sense of texture and clarity in the guitar and also in Amber Rubarth's vocals. You could hear a little bit more of her vocal texture. You could hear a little bit more of the finger work on the guitar, both the strumming or the picking and the fretboard itself. It was all just that little bit clearer. We're not talking night and day. We're not talking about two completely different sounding products, but it's like a little bit of a veil has been removed from the Mojo in moving to the Mojo 2. 
What that did mean though, is that on a headphone like the Aria that does have reasonably prominent treble, if you've seen my review of the Aria Stealth version, it's not quite as strong in the treble as the previous versions, but it does still have a bit of treble energy there. And I found that moving to the Mojo 2, that treble just got maybe a tiny bit too much for my tastes. And so in their stock setups, the Mojo in some ways was totally preferable. The nice thing with the Mojo 2 was that I could jump into the menu setting, go to the 3 kilohertz shelf and drop it by 1 dB and suddenly the Aria sounded just perfect. And so for me, that's where the Mojo 2 is really exceptional. The EQ does give you excellent control to just tweak the tonality a tiny bit and get it sounding just right with your headphones. All of a sudden, you don't need to buy a device that has the right synergy with your headphones or earphones. You can now make the device have the right synergy with your headphones or earphones within reason. There are some gaps in the Mojo 2's EQ. For example, if you had a pair of Empyreans and you wanted to pull back the fact that it goes up into 300 hertz with the bass boost, there's no way to pull back that 300 hertz. So it doesn't allow every possible tuning you could think of, but it's going to give you some really common tunings, particularly giving a general bass shelf to bass shy headphones, or as I've done with the Arias, pulling back the treble just ever so slightly. One other detail that really stood out to me from the Mojo 2 as I listen more and more is that it does a better job of making subtle micro details more available. So while listening to Washing Day, there were little sounds coming from the audience or the stage, little movements that maybe the singer made that led to a sound, it was more available from the Mojo 2. I'm not saying they weren't there at all on the Mojo, but with the Mojo 2 I felt like everything was laid out for me to hear, nothing was pushed at me, but it was all available, and that's really lovely. If you've got yourself a high-end pair of earphones or headphones, you're going to hear everything they're capable of with the Mojo 2, whereas the original Mojo can smooth things over just a little bit. It's a sound that I happen to enjoy in the Mojo, but I do recognise it's a slight shortcoming for those that are craving absolute transparency. So at this stage, I was really impressed with what I was hearing. The listening test did back up everything that Rob Watts and Cord were saying, and so I do want to reiterate that whilst I'm not a Chord fanboy, I am a fan of Chord, and particularly I'm a fan of Rob Watts' designs, because everything he puts into these products is built on a two-pronged approach. He does everything based on subjective science, both in terms of our hearing perception science, but also in terms of the engineering and the design science in digital and analog audio reproduction, but then he also bases it on listening tests. And so to me, what I've heard going from the Mojo to the Mojo 2 is that everything he's aimed to design into this, everything he's theoretically aimed to achieve, is absolutely working beautifully. But there was one final thing I wanted to test out, and that is the talk that this can now operate really effectively as a desktop DAC. The design in the power management system has been done to enable people to use the Mojo 2 as a fully fledged desktop device, in the sense that you can leave it plugged in indefinitely for three, four years if you want to, and it's not gonna harm the battery. And so that got me thinking, is this now also a replacement for a DAC like, say, the Shit by Frost 2? I'm also a huge fan, as you might know, of Shit's multi-bit DACs. And so I grabbed the Bifrost 2, I connected the two of these up, and I aimed to see if the Mojo 2 was now a better DAC than the Bifrost 2. Part of my reasoning for this is that the Bifrost 2 is priced at roughly the same level as the Mojo 2 is going to be. The Bifrost 2 offers things like balanced outputs with XLR sockets, as well as proper RCA outputs for single-ended, and a full-size USB connection as well. So there are definitely benefits in having a full-size desktop device. I am aware of that when I talk about this comparison. I was curious mostly though, to see if the sound quality was comparable between the two. I'll leave it up to you to think about the ergonomics. So for this testing setup, I had both devices running from generic USB cables coming out of my laptop, going into each of the DACs, and then feeding from the different devices into the Burson Solaris 3XP. I was using different interconnects because I don't have matching interconnects that are XLR in the case of the Bifrost 2 and 3.5mm to RCA in the case of the Mojo 2. So there's lots of variations in this source chain, but I hoped I got it close enough that I could sense any differences and not have them come down to quality of cable. I took a lot of time to make sure I volume matched the Mojo 2's output to what I was hearing from the Bifrost 2, and so everything was done here with volume matching and driving the Arias once again as my headphone. One of the tracks I used for this testing was Killing by the Apples. This is a really cool track. If you've never heard this one, do check it out. It's a cover version of Killing in the Name of by Rage Against the Machine, but done in a really different way, and I think it's really cool. 
What I heard when I started listening to this track was a sound from both DACs that was fantastic. Both produce a great sense of space, they produce some layering in the soundstage, they're both very enjoyable listens. The Bifrost 2 came across significantly richer and warmer, whereas the Mojo 2 was coming across a bit leaner. I double checked there was no EQ running, and there wasn't, and yet both DACs still had a significantly different sound. The next thing I noticed was that the Bifrost 2 was pushing everything a lot more left right, and then I realised I had crossfeed left on. It's a bit of a rookie mistake that I made, and so I had to switch that off and start again, and then what I heard was that everything actually sounded a lot more similar. These DACs perform very, very similarly. And I think that's great. What that tells you is that the Mojo 2 is absolutely worth the price you're paying for it, in the sense that it's performing at the same sort of level as another product that is an excellent equivalent product at the same approximate price. Value is always going to be up to you. You might say both of them are overpriced. That's entirely up to you to say. I'm not going to say if it's the right amount of value. My point is they're priced comparably. They're performing comparably. Now that I had them both set up in the same way though, in other words, no crossfeed from the Mojo 2, no EQ from the Mojo 2, what I heard was that the Bifrost 2 was still just a little bit fuller sounding. It wasn't drastic, it didn't suddenly make the Bifrost 2 sound thick and muddy or anything like that, but there was definitely a slight sense of warmth and richness from the Bifrost 2, whereas the Mojo 2 did come across a little bit leaner. As to which one is correct and accurate, I wouldn't actually want to say they're too close together, but I do think those that like a sense of cleanliness and naturality from their DAX, the Mojo 2 probably would be the choice. I'm always a fan of starting with a very neutral DAC and adding any coloration you want through an amplifier, but more importantly through headphones. And so for me, the Mojo 2 is probably the slightly better choice in that regard if your philosophy is similar to mine, but the Bifrost 2 is by no means thick and rich or muddy or anything like that. It just was a little bit more full bodied compared to the Mojo 2. We're talking two or 3% difference. The Bifrost 2 also delivers a slightly more intimate sound. It's not close in or congested, but it's not quite as spacious as the Mojo 2 delivers. For its size, the Mojo 2 is pretty impressive with what it outputs in terms of quality, refinement, a sense of spaciousness, etc. You don't expect that sort of performance from a teeny tiny device like this. To me, both of these products are very, very comparable in terms of sound quality. So I don't want to overstate the differences. I do think what I heard was more than just the cables I had attached for creating the influence. So in other words, I do think the starting point of the Bifrost 2 is that slightly more intimate and slightly richer sound, but I can't stress enough that it was minor percentages of difference. So both are outstanding DACs, both are incredible choices. The difference is of course that with the Bifrost 2, you're getting a fully fledged desktop DAC with all the benefits of the various connectivity like XLR and RCA and full sized USB B socket versus a teeny tiny device that's a little bit more fiddly to connect, but it's also a desktop solution that you can pick up, put in your pocket and take with you as well as driving directly most IEMs and headphones on the planet. So it really depends on what you're looking for. I don't think it could go wrong with either DAC. But let's bring this back around now to the Mojo 2. Is it revolutionary or is it just evolutionary? I think things like the implementation of Crossfeed and EQ are absolutely revolutionary. This takes it beyond any digital audio player that I've heard, any dongle that I've heard. It absolutely makes it a winner. Assuming, of course, you've got a transport to feed at the files to play back. It's not comparable to a DAP in that sense because a DAP is also the transport. But if you have a transport solution to feed at the files, this is absolutely revolutionary in terms of the functionality it provides and the sound quality. What's more evolutionary though, in other words, it's more of an incremental step, is the sound quality. It's not a giant, giant leap from the Mojo. If the Mojo performs at say an eight out of 10, and I'm just taking arbitrary numbers here, but if this is an eight out of 10, I think the Mojo 2 is probably taking us to an eight and a half or a nine out of 10. It's not this massive leap going from a five out of 10 to a 10 out of 10. It's an incremental step. It's a great step. It's a significant step, and the combination with things like the EQ and the crossfeed make the Mojo 2 incredibly versatile. But it is important to note, if you're loving your Mojo, if you're really happy and you don't want to spend the money, don't feel like there's suddenly this completely different thing going on. It's the same essential device, improved incrementally with some extra features that you might absolutely never use. For me, from both a personal music lover's point of view, and also from a reviewer's point of view, the Mojo 2 is a must-have on my list. 
I love the fact that you can now tweak the EQ in a way that doesn't damage the transparency of the music. I also love the fact that I can play with crossfeed. With a pair of magical IEMs, like say the Shaw KSE 1200s or the Sennheiser IE 900s, the crossfeed function on the Mojo 2 is absolutely sublime. So both as a music listener and someone who tests a lot of gear, the Mojo 2 is very high on my list to buy. That said, the original Mojo is still excellent and you shouldn't feel that you absolutely have to upgrade. Likewise, if you're looking at different DACs on the market, the Mojo 2 is now a fairly compelling option as a do-it-all device, desktop DAC and portable all-in-one. It's not quite going to replace the Bifrost 2 for me as my recommended desktop DAC because I do still appreciate the connectivity and the simplicity of a full-size device but the Mojo 2 definitely has a place in that conversation, in my opinion. So at this point, I hope you found this review useful. Hopefully I've answered lots of questions that you might have had leading up to the availability of the Mojo 2. I really hope this has been helpful for you. If there's anything I've missed, do feel free to ask questions down in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer them if I can. And if you found this useful, as always, I'd love it if you hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and ring the notification bell to let YouTube know that you want to see more videos like this from me. But for now, I'll leave you to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.